Welcome to Loaded and Rolling. I'm your host, Thomas Wasson. Now we have a special thing going on today. Uh, we're going to try and see if we can have my virtual assistant read uh, basically why containers are important. This is the first time in Freight Waves, by the way, so this may not work because we are indeed live, but let's see if we have some audio or video of my chat GPT-3 assistant. Chassis are important to both ocean carriers and trucking companies because they play a critical role in the transportation of cargo. For ocean carriers, chassis are the wheeled frames that support shipping containers when they are transported on land. When a container arrives at a port, it is loaded onto a chassis, which then connects to a tractor truck and is transported to its final destination. Without chassis, it would be impossible to transport containers efficiently, as they would need to be loaded and unloaded individually from flatbed trailers. Additionally, Standardization of chassis sizes and specifications enables efficient handling and transfer of containers between different transportation modes. For trucking companies, chassis are also essential as they provide the foundation for the trailer. Chassis serve as the base frame onto which the trailer and cargo are mounted, providing the necessary support and stability during transportation. Additionally, standardization of chassis sizes and specifications allows trucking companies to interchange trailers without the need to change the chassis, which saves time and reduces costs. In summary, chassis are a critical component of the transportation infrastructure for both ocean carriers and trucking companies, enabling efficient and safe transport of goods across different modes of transportation. I could not have run it better myself. Luckily, it was a robot version of myself. First time, by the way, we've done it here at Freight Waves. So eventually we'll have the video. Uh, we'll try that next time. But speaking of technologies, the value of chassis and everything that goes into it, I'm very, very happy to talk about, joining me to talk about chassis and the freight that goes on them is Carl Philhauer. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Carl, he is uh, the vice president over at uh, Circle Logistics. And we're going to be talking a little bit about uh, why it is important, sales and operations. So quick backstory, Carl, happy to have you back on as well. You've been in the industry since 83, so you've seen it all. We have you coming back to talk about chassis. Uh, tell us a little bit about the history. I remember we were talking to you before we had you on uh, that you, you've been aware of how it's gone between the steamships, the containers, and how all this interchange has been going on. So it's, we've come a long ways. We uh, have transitioned since I joined the industry from having uh, actual intermodal uh, trailers as well as containers. So you'd have a container on flat car versus a trailer on flat car. Most of those uh, pieces of equipment were owned either by the rail or if it was an international shipment, the containers were owned by the steamship lines. And, and back in the day, the steamship lines also owned the bulk of the chassis that were used. Um, there was obviously multiple owners, but they had what was called or referred to as chassis pools. And those pools were pieces of land where, where trailer or chassis were managed uh, by any rail hub. And they were available, you, the driver would go in, he would pick up a chassis, he would get the container put on the back, pay separate for the chassis than he would the container. Uh, or be charged differently. And of course, like everything else, there's uh, demerge and storage and everything else of both trailers and chassis. So we've migrated away from that in effectively about 12, 15 years ago, the steamship lines started to eliminate their chassis. They didn't want to have the hassle of maintaining the chassis and uh, doing the upkeep. And uh, it was also very difficult for them to track damaged chassis, repair work, and then charge that back to whoever the carrier was. So they, they chose to get out of the chassis business. Um, at the same time that was going on, domestically, we have major carriers that have their own chassis and their own 53-foot containers that do domestic intermodal business uh, all the time. Generally speaking, those carriers uh, maintain and have their own chassis pool, but there are... Uh, other chassis pools that are accessible, whether you're a broker or a small carrier, you can lease chassis on a, on a one-off as needed basis. Um, so we've graduated quite a bit. I think the estimate today is there are close to 700,000 chassis in the U.S. that are somehow part of a fleet or part of a fleet of rental chassis out there. Um, we've grown a lot. The landscape has changed in the way it looks. Uh, but you still have to have a chassis uh, to put a container on before you're going to deliver it. 
And talking about the pandemic as well, it's fascinating you mentioned that the container ships, the steamships decided to get out of it, putting pressure on the actual carriers domestically. Was that when we ran into a situation where chassis just weren't turning and the pools were full? Well, there's not a way you could just beget more chassis, I'm assuming. Well, uh, this, I think the struggle goes beyond that. The, there was a lot of chassis that should have been scrapped years and years ago. So we're in the process of doing that, or we have been for the last five to eight years. And, ha and new chassis then have to be manufactured. What the pandemic did to that was it slowed down the manufacturing process. So there was a time here, and it's, I believe we're still in it today, where if you wanted to buy 10 new chassis or potentially 20 new chassis, they're made domestically, but they're also made abroad. And the waiting list to have them produced for you based on your specs is about 18 months. So it, it's not like you can just turn around and say, well, I, I need a chassis. I don't have my own today. I'm going to go rent one. They're not available to even rent. The pandemic further exacerbated the problem in that the supply chain was so upset that inbound ocean shipments, specifically on the West Coast, were when they when the ships did arrive, the containers were put on chassis, and in many cases, those chassis and uh, containers became storage units. And so the chassis weren't getting back into the system for other inbound containers. Um, domestically, I believe we deliver somewhere in the neighborhood of 35 million domestic and international containers from some sort of a hub to the customer every year. And again, I mentioned earlier, we've got about 700,000 chassis that they, the IANA network feels that are in uh, part of our capacity today. That's a 40, 40, 40 to 1 option there, where there's 40 more containers that have to be delivered than there are chassis available to put them on. So when there's an interruption in supply chain and there's backlogs, those backlogs just look even worse when it comes to chassis and, and, uh, and uh, container management. Well, it reminds me of in trucking, you'd have a three to one trailer pool ratio frequently. You know, you wanna make sure you have quite enough to haul, but a 40 to one for the, the chassis themselves sounds pretty crazy. I'm assuming that's because in a perfect world scenario, drayage operations and intermodal, you turn multiple loads per day on a chassis, but if they're stored, it just bogs down. Correct. Yep, absolutely. And in most drayage moves are one day moves or maybe a half a day. <clears throat> They're usually within about 100 miles of the hub. A long drayage move goes three to maybe 500 miles from a hub. But again, with that, I think we talked the last time, you're paying round trip miles when you're ta talking to a drayman because he not only has to pick up the container, bring it to the customer, he then has to bring that same container back to a container pool and or the chassis has to come back to a pool if they don't reload it right away. So coordinating uh, that as far as getting the right amount of chassis in the right location for the amount of uh, containers coming in is, is not an easy task. It reminds me when I was a broker, uh, when you would have to do that leading up to the pandemic or if there was delays, Port of Savannah, for example, uh, carpets and laminate flooring would come in and you would pay obscene amounts of money if you needed to take it up to northern Georgia or if you're able to, it managed to cross dock and then you pay someone much less full truckload to move it. Is that something where uh, if you're a drayage company too, uh, do you want to decide to just take the chassis all the way and burn a whole day or is it better for both brokers and drayage folks to stay to those smaller moves, multiple turns and make that margin off the difference? Um, well, there's two, two schools of thought there. <clears throat> there's plenty of draymen that do not want to go outside of a metro area wherever that hub is located. So they're doing short haul same day and they're turning maybe three or four containers a day. Four would be a lot uh, unless it's a, a really well run customer as far as their receiving is concerned. So there's a lot of draymen. That's all they want to do. And then there's another group of draymen that will do both the long haul and the short haul. And then there's some that would really just prefer to run long haul. And I'm sure everyone on the show has seen flatbed trailers going down the road with a container strapped to it. In many cases, that's going for a long haul and it's, it's gonna go quite a ways from the hub. And, and it might even be offloaded from that flatbed and put on the ground for some sort of a short-term storage. So there, there's 
multiple ways to skin the cat if you're a drayman. You have to decide whether you've got the right equipment for the long haul, but there's a lot of draymans that will just do the short haul. And for folks who are unfamiliar with the type of market, especially drayage, the first time I really heard about it was when I joined a brokerage. When I did long haul trucking, we normally just showed up at a DC. It already matriculated throughout that point of the supply chain. Is it something where this landscape is dominated by brokerages or forwarders, or what's the landscape look like for folks coming from like a full truckload standpoint, just trying to figure out what the heck's going on before it hits a DC? So it, it's a little bit different for each kind of equipment. So if you look at the largest carriers, uh, the actual asset carriers here in the U.S., the, the Hunts, the Schneiders, the Swift Knights, those truck lines generally will own their own containers as well as a fleet of their own chassis, and they can match those. But they're still going to rely on overflow available chassis if they've got heavy volume coming in where they're running short in a particular market. Um, and that's kind of self-contained within those larger carriers. If you get to the smaller carriers and or Drayman, uh, they generally will have their own chassis and they will own their own chassis. They might have a pool of 10 or 20 of them. Those pool sizes are adjusted based on how much of the market share they've got in the market that they're going to service. Most of the time they will own some of them, but they will generally lease most of them. Uh, and again, the leases can be short-term daily type rentals or they can be a long-term lease. Um, there's one particular company that's grown quite rapidly during COVID. Uh, it's, a, it's an investment group called Apollo. I believe they own the vast majority of the chassis fleet that's available to the leasing public in the U.S. right now. Um, and they continue to grow from what I've seen. Uh, if you're a smaller company, you're going to rely on them when you when you have to, but you're going to want to, if you can control your own chassis and you can control the way your, your containers are turning so they're not being used for storage, having your own chassis is a good way to go. Now, the struggle is if you're a, a newer company and you're an upstart, finding available chassis is hard. If you wanted to buy them, again, there's an 18-month wait uh, with most manufacturers that are building chassis. So it's not as easy as just saying, I'm going to enter the market and I'm going to go lease what I need. Are the leases available and or you can't go to the market and say, I'm going to buy what I need because you're going to wait a long time to get the, that purchase order fulfilled if you're building and buying brand new chassis. That's what I'm curious if it'll ease up. I remember we were talking about, uh, I'd looked up some OEM build numbers on trailers. It was like uh, maybe between seven and nine months, depends on the time and, and equipment and stuff. But uh, for, for that situation, does it seem like a lot of new upstarts are just gonna go, in your opinion, like you just get a dry van trailer if you can't get a chassis, or is it really lucrative to try and get in on this, even if you are starting at kind of a disadvantage? Uh, well, there's ways to get in on it. I mean, we, we as a broker circle, we provide uh, a service where we can coordinate getting the chassis to a smaller operator or carrier if they don't have chassis of their own available. And we coordinate the driver, the tractor, which is part of the carrier, as well as the chassis and then the dispatch of the load. Um, we're doing a lot of that. I don't believe there's a lot of true brokers doing that. There's a lot of intermodal marketing companies that dabble in it. And, and they really uh, hone in on the intermodal side of the business. Um, so there, there is some people entering the market on it. Uh, the beauty of it is if, if you're in the position we're in, we work with smaller mom and pop carriers as well as the larger carriers. And uh, the fact remains that most of the carriers in this country are small carriers. The bulk of the capacity comes from those smaller carriers. And those people are generally very open to doing what we would call a power only move where we're getting the driver and the tractor, but we'll coordinate the equipment that they need. We'll make sure it's either leased short term or rented. If it's a chassis, we'll make sure there's one available from one of our pools or, or from one of the uh, leasing companies we work with. And then we'll coordinate the pickup of whomever owns that container and where that goes. Um, so we can coordinate it all. Smaller companies could do it on their own. The problem is they're not sophisticated enough to have, and they're not large enough to have the multiple contracts you have to have in place to coordinate that type of movement of equipment. I think I like your talk on the, your topics on power only because uh, when I was a load planner at a large asset-based carrier, 
you know, we do preload, drop and hook trailers. But what was fascinating was some brokerages that are part of the larger carriers are using an overflow method where if they have a preloaded load they can't cover, they're going to kick it over to power only. And ironically, the same carriers that are using it, they still have to find trailers to bring in, like take a penny, leave a penny, just like the drivers. It's amazing. And your experience is even as a brokerage. Does it feel like it's exploded over the past few years? Brokers are finally dipping into this power only as another solution? Um, I think it has. It, it's the certain, certainly the approach to the business from a broker standpoint has changed. Uh, we're not the only brokerage that does that. It's typically going to be the larger brokers that could pull that off. So, yeah, it's changed. Uh, one of my fears is we're sliding back into the same cadence transportation had years ago. Uh, the pandemic blew everything out of the water. And now if you were to talk to most transportation uh, experts today, they would tell you that we're going to allow businesses down and they blame the economy at the greater economy at large. But business is down, uh, not just because of where the economy is and the lingering effects of the COVID crisis, but business is down because cyclically it always used to be down the first quarter of the year. So January was slow for many, many carriers and, and 3PLs. Um, February was slow. March came back. Uh, personally, with, with Circle here, we had a pretty decent March. We saw good increases in, in, in business flow. Now, April, I'm guessing it's going to go down again. March was busy because it was the end of the first quarter. And the, the old shipping cycles were the end of every quarter, most large shippers were trying to clear their warehouses and fulfill orders to get it on the books. Um, we're falling back into that cycle. The problem we'll see if that cycle really takes hold for the rest of this year is in the fall. So from August until Thanksgiving, that's the heaviest shipping period for retail. Not just going from a retail distribution center but into the store, but coming inbound from overseas. And it used to be really heavily laden. It still is in China. The stuff that we buy in the stores during that Christmas season is coming in from China. So you've got two peak seasons that are going to converge come August, September, and October, where... If you're a retailer and you are going into power only, so a lot of big retailers have a dedicated fleet. That dedicated fleet is set up to be sized so that it can always stay busy in the slowest of months. But there's overflow, and that's where a dedicated fleet operation is going to bring in power only people. They've got the trailers, but they need people just to bring trailers from a DC to a store and do a drop and hook. That's going to peak again in August, September, and October of this year. At least I believe it will. And if the ch if we still have a chassis shortage, and if imports that are coming into the country that are retail uh, related, all of that's going to happen at the same time. So I, I believe, like most economists I've talked to, that we're going to start to see some relief come July or August uh, when it comes to the volume level of that we've seen deteriorate. Um, and, and if we do, and if it comes back hard, we could have a big problem this coming fall when it comes to the retail season. And the retail season affects every carrier, no matter if they haul for retailers or not, because it sucks up a lot of capacity. I remember, I remember the special projects uh, like Home Depot's, P&G's, Walmart's. Large customers would ask, can we have like 150 trucks, just power only? Can we just, we'll pay you each week for them. And they just have them move things around for me, like uh, the Black Friday Blitz stuff that Walmart typically does. I kind of wonder, I want to get your thoughts on this too. Uh, two years is a long time in this industry. So do, do you ever feel like, and uh, this is from my experience as well, that a lot of this tribal knowledge of what to expect in seasonality has kind of been forgotten to an extent because we've been so used to this boom. Now it feels like a bust. Now we're coming back to what's normal. And a lot of leaders now haven't really had that experience of knowing multiple cycles of what to expect. Yeah, I, I think that's a challenge. I, I run into quite a few people who are either working for friendly competitors of ours or customers. Um, th there is a challenge there in that institutional knowledge has not been passed along. So if it's a young person working for other young people who might be really good at what they do and have great industry knowledge, as you pointed out, they've never experienced that ebb and flow of the seasonality of, of how our industry works. So it, it's going to be a learning curve. Now, most of the young people I've met in the industry 
uh, and I'm old, so there's there's a lot of them that are younger than me, are pretty darn sharp, you know, so they'll pick up on it pretty quick, and they should be able to adapt and make adjustments where needed. Wanted to talk a little bit about technology here for final final little bit. Uh, I know that you got to see, we tested out by, this was last minute, spur of the moment, we tried to see if the chat prompt could write about trailer chassis because it struggles with very technical stuff. But looking at things like that, being a brokerage and stuff, do you think that there's going to be value in the future for kind of assistance like that to either draft emails or help with conversations? Is that kind of a thing that's on the radar right now or is it more towards optimizing load boards and operational efficiencies? Um, I've heard chatter of it. I, I hope we don't go down that road. Uh, the, the more we allow AI to take over our day-to-day -day activity as individuals, the dumber we get. Uh, if we're not fully engaged in what we're doing in learning about what's going on and we're relying on a system to really put the logic to whatever the problem is and come up with a result that's going to be acceptable to all parties, uh, I don't think we're going in the right direction. We have to have human intervention. There have to have people who understand how the entire process works. Um, and if, if AI successfully gets too over-involved in transportation, we're going to have problems. I, I, I think AI is great with uh, self-driving vehicles. I think that will be part of our world in a big way, probably within the next five to 10 years. Uh, but you, there still needs to be human intervention in human thought going into anything we struggle with from a process standpoint. I think that's a great point. I talked to a lot of people who work in AI, and it feels like you can have a really good you know, uh, algorithm, but if you don't have the people to tell it what to do or use it as a tool instead of a crutch, you're going to run into like a lot of issues. Right. Yeah, what you'll run into is... Uh, liability that we face every day. So although AI could be pretty intuitive and it can be set up and programmed to do a lot of our thought process, uh, what it won't do though is look at any ancillary potential exposure we have to liability, whether it's because of processes, whether it's because of equipment that's failing or not working well, or whether it's just, <clears throat> excuse me, a relationship with a customer. You have to have that. The best customers we have are very collaborative, and we've got a lot of customers. And the, the, the big guys who have well-trained, well-schooled individuals running those supply chain departments, they realize they need to develop partnerships. And I don't believe AI is going to be an asset in developing a partnership and being able to be flexible with your trading partners to fill the voids that are created just by our day-to-day -day life. There's always a gray zone that needs to be managed. And when it's not managed, it could, it could produce uh, not only an area of exposure, but some pretty big liability. Well, I think also a basic level of trust, too. I'd only assume if I talk to enough chatbots, the poor Robo Tom has tried its best to read, but it still has work to do. So I have to record more shows to feed it more inputs. But, you know, I guess that's another thing. At the end of the day, working at a brokerage, working in supply chain transportation, I hate to sound cliche, but I guess it's still about relationships, right? It absolutely is. Yes, it is. Well, I appreciate you coming on the show. Uh, final thoughts, if folks want to reach out more, learn more about what Circle's getting into uh, as well, or try to partner up, what's the best way to get in contact with you all? Well, you've got, well, I can be emailed by anybody anytime if they like. My, uh, my name is obviously Carl Philhauer, should be on the screen there, first initial, then last name, at circledelivers.com. We, we've got a, an intuitive website you can log into, and you can uh, request information through that, or call Circle Logistics in and we can get somebody on the phone with you if you've got questions that you need help with. Perfect. Thanks so much, Carl. Good getting to talk to you again and uh, happy you're going to have to catch up again and, uh, and see what you all are getting into as well as the technology. It's always a pleasure. Yep, as well. Thank you. That's going to be a wrap for today's show, but if you are listening today or hopefully tomorrow, we're going to have an event coming up as well. 
Uh, Going to have a 3PL summit in April, and we're also having a supply chain meets fintech coming up on March 15th. You can check it out. If you missed it, you can always find it at uh, live.freightwaves.com. Sign up, check it out. I got to plug it. There's some pretty cool stuff going on there as well. You can also catch the loaded and rolling newsletter. It comes out Thursdays at 2 p.m. Eastern, and you can also always catch us live here on tv.freightwaves.com for loaded and rolling every Tuesday at 1 Eastern. That's a wrap, but don't fret. You'll see me again next week. We'll do it live.